Our next speaker is Joe Cohen. Joe is a partner in the Houston office of Byrne, Maynard & Parsons. Joe has experience in a broad range of complex litigation, including commercial energy, commercial energy, regulatory, trade secret, real estate, insurance, consumer class action, pharmaceuticals, and business co-owner disputes. His practice includes counseling businesses and trade associations on antitrust, unfair competition, shareholder issues, directors and officers liability issues, insurance coverage, and legislative issues. Here to share his lessons learned from lender liability litigation, please welcome Joe Cohen. You're wondering what lender liability has to do with this conference, and I will tell you. The consolidation in the financial services industries of lending services with investment services has put banks and financial institutions in a different cast and a different light than they were 30 years ago when I was a young lawyer representing financial institutions in lender liability cases. But I want to begin today, if I can find the button, green button, by telling you a story. Whoops, if we can go back one, there we go. By telling you a story that I think will illustrate some lessons that I learned that you and your clients and institutions around the country can benefit from. A young associate walked into my office one day and said, uh, I need your help with a case. I've written a demand letter for a financial institution to a customer asking him to repay a line of credit. In response, we got a lawsuit. The lawsuit dealt with an investment account a securities account. He was asking for about a million dollars in damages. And so we picked up the phone and called the client and said, let's get the records, let's get the account agreement, let's go look for the arbitration clause. And sure enough, there was an arbitration clause. So as is common in most jurisdictions, there's a meet and confer requirement. So we called the customer's counsel and said, we're going to respond with a motion to compel arbitration. Are you going to be opposed to the motion? He said, you bet. I said, do you want to enlighten me as to why? He said, yes. That's a forgery. I said, OK. So we picked up the phone, called the client, said, there's a little problem. What's the problem? Well, the borrower, the customer says, account agreement's been forged. Let's talk to the uh, account representative. Let's find out. Let's get the story. Next day, we get a phone call from the client. Our um, account representative doesn't work for us anymore. OK, well, where is he? Well, he's working for a competitor now. We call the competitor, go through channels, through HR, legal department, come to find that our account representative doesn't work for the competitor anymore. We tracked him down, only to learn that he was under indictment for federal securities violations. And his lawyer made it very clear he was not going to talk to us and uh, that if we subpoenaed him, he was going to plead the Fifth Amendment. This was just wonderful news when the client heard all of this. They were just overjoyed. This was a case that should have gone to arbitration, but was going to have to be tried. And our first issue was, who was going to tell the client's story. And what was the story? Of course, immediately the client said, let's get this case settled. We approached the customer's lawyer, and the customer's lawyer said, uh, our damage model is so many dollars, but we want a half million dollars on top. This was egregious conduct, and we think a jury will give it to us. And of course, like most of you, clients say, we don't settle cases by paying exemplary damages. So we were going to have to tell a story. We got all the account records, looked at it. And if you looked at the records for a brief period of time, you could see there was a significant loss. If you looked at the account records over the full course of the two and a half years the customer had had his account there, there was no loss. The complaint alleged control person liability issues against the managers of the securities division of this financial institution. And uh, there was nobody there to tell a story. But of course, in every case, you can always find someone to tell the story. And it's usually through an expert. We spent the good part of about 
a month's worth of billable time looking for the right person. We couldn't get Susie Orman, but we did get someone from the local university who was in the business school who taught in the finance department, who also taught a course in the evening school on investing in the stock market. And my criteria for finding an expert is to look for someone who reminds you of your best and most interesting teacher in middle school, because our audience on a jury is about an eighth, ninth grade education across the board on average. This was someone who could make all of this stuff come alive. There was a churning allegation in the case. Most of us in this room know what churning is. We know it when we see it. There are legal instructions from cases from years ago that talk about what a, turning, a, a turnover ratio is and what churning is, but I dare say a lay, lay jury is not going to have any clue what in the world a turnover ratio is. So as we prepare to go forward, we work with our expert, and he agreed with us that, yes, there was a small window of time when you could have shown a significant loss, but through luck, through whatever, this bad dude who had... Uh, traded in this account without authority, had managed to maybe make a little bit of money for this guy. So then we had to think of, well, what's our theme? Every case needs a theme. This was not a case about personal responsibility. Not very easy to show that the uh, customer was at fault in this case. Maybe greedy, but not at fault. So our theme became maybe a foul, but no harm. We requested the kind of standard things you expect from a customer in a case like this. We asked for something in particular. We asked for his tax returns, knowing full well they were sworn prior statements that might shed some light on what he claimed were his losses. And as you know, in most jurisdictions, tax returns are not easy to get. The judge in this case told us, sorry, counselor, you can't get the tax returns. We were going to have to explain to the jury what a turnover ratio was. So we went to our favorite prop room that I use in every case when I can, Walmart. We went to the prop room at Walmart and we got a clear plastic bucket and some building blocks. And we put the security symbols on the sides of each one of those building blocks, filled up the bucket, turned it over to be able to illustrate to a jury what a turnover ratio was. At the end of the day, when you took all those building blocks, put them in the bucket, over about a year and a half, the bucket had been filled up once and had been emptied once. So things were looking good for us on that count. During his deposition, the customer had insisted that he had not been actively involved in any type of securities trading or investing prior to this relationship. And without his tax returns, we wouldn't have any real way to test that. Well, about a week before discovery closed, we get a disclosure that says there are three other victims who had been injured by this customer, and they were now on the witness list. We went back to the client. The client said, let's go to mediation. Went to mediation. The customer didn't budge. We moved forward, and in our pretrial order, we asked to, the court to limit out the other victims, unfair, prejudicial evidence. The judge, who had tried a few securities cases herself before she went on the bench, said, counsel, you've got control person issues in this case. If you put management on to say they had adequate controls in place, I'm going to let those other victims testify in rebuttal. And so we went to trial. As part of our pretrial order, we also had a, mo a renewed motion to secure those tax returns. And our theory was, judge, you ought to look at those tax returns in camera. Tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. And of course, the plaintiff got on the stand and testified just as he had in his deposition. None of these trades were authorized. He didn't know about them. He'd been injured, had a former SEC official testify as an expert on a damage model. And then we got a lucky break in the case. The judge read the tax returns. And sure enough, our customer had engaged in a number of exotic transactions before he had ever met our client. 
But the case wasn't going particularly well for us, and the judge took me aside and said, in front of the other counsel, and said, look, you need to settle this case. Things are not going well for you, and I don't understand the theory of your case. And I said, well, judge, I won't uh, use this with the jury, but I said this is a case where, at the end of the day, the customer's laundry is going to be dirtier than my client's laundry. Well, the client had to make a decision. Do we put control people on to testify about their controls or not? Since they had the burden of proof, the decision was made, we would put them on. And of course, each of the victims then testified about their experience. The jury had a case, had the case for a day and a half. And when they came back, they found that my client had violated the securities laws, had violated the Texas Deceptive Trade Practice Act, and committed fraud. But they came back and said there were no damages. So what were the lessons from all of this? And why do I share them with you now? Well, first of all, financial institutions are at an all-time low in public popularity. This is a Gallup poll that came out in June. And you can see the last 20 years, only 21 percent, uh, as measured in uh, June, have confidence in financial institutions. We've got a tough audience if you have to try one of these cases. So what are the lessons that we learned? First of all, why did somebody write a letter to this guy? No one ever looked, no one ever talked to the account representative. What's the story here? Is there going to be a problem? What don't the documents show? You know, in, in, the, in the loan world, I can tell you from my years of lender liability, there are things that lenders sometimes do that jump the gun. Is there a precipitous acceleration of a loan? I've told clients for years, your loan documents may have insecurity clauses, but juries never understand them. Was there some real reason to call a loan? Uh, was a lender involved in the borrower's management? Number two, it wasn't an issue in our case, but it can be an issue in your case. And I'm not going to talk about preservation of evidence other than to say it's a critical factor. When you know you're going to make a loan, I mean, uh, call a loan, or you know you're going to assert a claim, make sure that all of the reasonable things and steps that are required are taken to preserve evidence. Discovery get their documents and electronically stored information early. The sooner you know what they've done and what their story is, the better you can prepare your defense. Put the documents and the emails and everything in, in sequential order and chronological order before the depositions begin. And know the story, have your witnesses know the story before the first deposition. As we like to say, the trial begins when the first deposition is taken. Develop your themes early. Keep it simple. Find one that fits. Test it. If your case is big enough and you can afford a jury focus group, do it. Listen to what they have to say. If your case isn't big enough, find three people in the uh, file room or in the coffee room. Buy them a, a, a six-pack of beer or some coffee and explain it to them and see if they understand what the theory of your case. And use it. Use it to your benefit. Make sure that every witness is prepared before his or her testimony. If they don't know what the case is about, if they don't know what your themes are, you're going to run into trouble. Retain the best experts. Of course, they've got to be qualified, knowledgeable, and helpful. But they've got to be effective communicators. That jury in that case was sitting on the edge of their seats because they were learning something they didn't know that they could use. This expert made it come alive the same way that seventh or eighth grade teacher made some principle of math or science or geography or history come alive for you. A trial, use your voir dire to test prospective jurors on your trial themes. Find out where they, they fit into your story. Use your opening statement to show the jury how you're going to prove your theme. In our case, we made it very simple. This man wasn't hurt. If the plaintiff if you're the plaintiff, be prepared to call the borrower or the customer as an adverse witness. Tell your story through him if you can. Remember that often is the case in lender-related cases and financial institution cases where you're trying to collect a credit and there's a claim on the other side. The, customer may, the customer's lawyer very wisely is going to stipulate to liability on the loan and the amount of the loan. That's exactly what happened in our case. They did not want to have that issue come up before the jury. And if you're the defendant, Make sure your witness is prepared to be called adversely. There's nothing worse than having someone called and who isn't prepared and isn't ready to go. 
Lender liability is a, is a theme that started in the early 80s when banks and financial institutions were in trouble in Texas. And there's a nice paper I prepared that's got some historical information that uh, I commend you to read on your way home. Um, you know, we, we now live in a world where about 40 states have statute of frauds provisions that have made it very difficult to get oral representations and promises into claims against lenders. Uh, arbitration is widely used, as you're going to hear, over uh, the course of the day, and most courts are very much in favor and, and, and using arbitration, don't want to see cases in their court. But every once in a while, there's a case that falls outside that's the square peg in the hole. And if you remember these lessons, you will understand how to defend your case and reach a great result. Thank you for your time.